Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our prosthodontic series. So in the previous videos, we spent a lot of time talking about the background for prosthodontic treatment planning, occlusion concepts, and most recently, getting familiar with edentulous anatomy of patients. So now we're going to really dive into the high yield information that's tested on the board exam. And the first of these videos will be about pre-prosthetic surgery. That is surgery that you would perform before fabricating a denture for a patient because something is off with their anatomy that wouldn't be ideal for the placement of a denture. Maybe the bony contour is incorrect or a frenum, a frenum is attached too high. There are certain things that you can adjust before making the denture to have a better situation and a better long-term result. So the first of these procedures we'll talk about is a phrenectomy. And as I alluded to, sometimes the frenum is attached too high. That means it's attached too near the top of the alveolar ridge and would interfere with seating of the denture. So imagine that this patient doesn't have teeth and the labial frenum is attached near the top or highest point of the ridge. And this could be true for not just the labial frenum, but any frenum in the mouth. So the most commonly performed phrenectomy would be for the labial frenum, followed by the buccal, and least common would be the lingual phrenectomy. So it's important to remember that order. The next procedure is a free gingival graft. This is a periodontal plastics procedure, and it's necessary for some um, implants that are being used to support a denture, or in this case, some overdenture teeth. So a band of keratinized tissue is important in this scenario, and that's what a free gingival graft is doing. It's widening the band of keratinized tissue around implants or teeth. And keratinized tissue is so important in these scenarios because it's whiter, firmer tissue that enables better oral hygiene. It's not as sensitive to brushing as non-keratinized mucosa would be. It doesn't collect bacteria and plaque quite as easily, of course, for that reason. So these um, crowns that you're seeing are called conus crowns, C-O-N-U-S, and they're gold copings that the denture would fit over and lock into, hence the term overdenture. It's seating over these crowns. And the overdenture is nice in that you have these roots that are retained, which can slow down potential bone resorption of the alveolar ridge, and you retain the proprioceptive ability of having these periodontal ligaments intact. So some patients, if they're willing to um, have these crowns placed, can have a nicer result by having the denture lock in place a little bit better, and you maintain that proprioceptive ability. So another problem that we can have in a patient is hypermobile ridge. That's this flabby edentulous ridges that are common, especially in the, in the anterior maxilla. And that's what the image is showing here. So you're seeing this excess fibrous tissue that makes this uh, ridge rather uh, loose and flabby. And that's most common in the anterior maxilla. And that's what's most important to remember about this. So you could treat with a tissue conditioner if the tissue is inflamed. And if it's more severe, you may use electrosurgery or laser surgery to eliminate tissue if the conditioner is ineffective. But this can also eliminate the vestibule, which is not ideal for a denture patient. And you could, if you have a hypermobile ridge, you would use a large, uh, use large relief in the impression tray or perforate a custom tray when taking the impression. And so this would be to avoid displacing the ridge. Perfor perforating the custom tray would allow impression material to uh, flow through that perforation so that you're not putting so much pressure on the ridge and you get an accurate impression of the ridge in a passive position. Next we have epulis fissuratum, which is hyperplastic tissue not on the ridge, but it's usually 
in the vestibule area. It's a reaction caused by an ill-fitting denture, especially an overextended flange. So we talked about um, in the previous videos about the depth of the vestibule and the boundaries based on muscle attachments in certain areas. And so this is why it's important because we can cause this hyperplastic tissue reaction if the flange of the denture is extending too deep. So you would treat this with tissue conditioner and by adjusting the flange, uh, reducing it a little bit, and you could use surgery if you have an inadequate response with this treatment modality. Next we have a fibrous or pendulous tuberosity. So the tuberosity is the posterior region of the maxillary edentulous alveolar ridge. Um, of course, you have tuberosities in patients that have teeth, sort of like the retromolar pad of the lower arch. And a fibrous or pendulous tuberosity is common when large tuberosities, just anatomically, genetically large tuberosities, touch the retromolar pads. So this can interfere with denture construction by limiting interarch space. That's the space that exists between the upper and lower arch. So if these extend quite a far ways down, then and if they're contacting the retromolar pad when the patient's closed, that's not gonna leave you a whole lot of room to make a denture and fit everything you need to, the acrylic and the teeth. So this can be an issue and you could correct it by either surgical excision of the fibrous tissue or reducing the underlying bone. Next we have papillary hyperplasia, which almost guaranteed there will be a question on the exam concerning papillary hyperplasia. And edentulus and um, epilus fissuratum also appears quite a lot. So papillary hyperplasia is this multiple papillary projections of the palate caused by local irritation, ill-fitting denture, poor oral hygiene, and leaving dentures in all the time. So a combination of all four of these would cer almost certainly lead to some form of papillary hyperplasia. So this is on the palate. That's super important to remember. And candidiasis is the main etiology. So that's that candida infection, that fungal infection that can cause this reaction. And so you would treat with oral hygiene instruction, OHI, leave dentures out at night, soak the dentures in very diluted bleach and rinse thoroughly, use again that tissue conditioner, and you could brush the irritated areas very, very lightly with a soft brush. Um, and also, if you're dealing with candidiasis, this is a review from our oral pathology videos, you treat the candida infection with a statin like mycostatin or nystatin or an azole like fluconazole. All right, and here's another huge, huge concept that's tested on the board exam, and that's combination syndrome. Again, almost guaranteed to get a question on this one. And it's a specific pattern of bone resorption in the anterior edentulous maxilla when it is opposing mandibular anterior teeth only. So this is the situation it would look like exactly like this, where patients missing all their upper teeth, they're fully edentulous on the upper arch, and they only have their front lower teeth. So they're partially edentulous, missing their posterior teeth on the lower arch. And so the combination syndrome has these this collection of symptom, signs and symptoms. And you have an overgrowth of tuberosities. So you're going to have that fibrous pendulous tuberosity. You have papillary hyperplasia in the hard palate, which is what we just talked about. You'll have extrusion of the lower anterior teeth. They're coming in too far and loss of bone under the partial denture bases. So this would be if you had a patient and you made them an upper complete denture and a lower partial denture, it's extremely challenging to make prostheses for this kind of patient. And you have to be very careful with combination syndrome in mind because these things can occur and create a very problematic situation for the patient. So they have 
only these front lower anterior teeth missing everything else. Think combination syndrome. All right, so we have retained root tips. And this is an interesting question. Like if the patient has some root tips, they're buried under the gums, do we need to extract them before placing dentures? And the answer is, it depends. So residual root tips that are non-root canal treated can be infection risks. They don't, uh, they're necrotic, they can't protect themselves, and the root canal is like a highway of infection where bacteria can enter into and get into the bone underneath. So that in mind, residual root tips may be left alone, according to the board exam standards, if they have an intact lamina dura and no radiolucency. So in this image, this root tip appears to have been extracted, this one left in place, and you can see an intact lamina dura, it's that thin radiopaque line surrounding the root, and no radiolucency, no apical, no periapical radiolucency that would be associated with infection or a cyst or something of that nature. So if it doesn't have a radiolucency and it does have an intact lamina dura, you can leave the root tip alone and place the denture over the top. Next we have Paget's disease, which uh, we covered in oral pathology videos, and it has unknown origin, uh, unknown etiology, bone resorption, and repair that's going in this uncontrolled cycle leading to deformities, and the classic board's question of a patient with uh, a hat that's no longer fitting or dentures that are no longer fitting, that's because the skull is undergoing lots of deformities. And so dentures would have to be remade periodically as the bone is remodeled. So again, that's that classic board's question of patient's denture no longer fitting due to bony expansion and remodeling from Paget's disease. All right, so we talked about a bunch of conditions. Now, what can we do to um, fix those things and get the patient ready for receiving a denture? So the first of those is alveoplasty or alveoloplasty, and that's the surgical reshaping of alveolar bone. So you can do this with a, a surgical burr like you see here, uh, with a ronger forceps, with a bone file, all things that we'll cover when we eventually do an oral surgery series. And so it's useful for sharp, spiny, or extremely irregular ridges that are um, that are getting in the way of the denture seating properly. And along with that is tori removal, would be a particular type of alveoplasty. And it's performed if the torus or tori creates an undercut or interferes with the posterior palatal seal. So remember, that was that extremely important area of the upper arch where the upper denture would seal against the palate, all that surface area up there. So if there's this big palatal torus that's in the way of that, that would have to be removed because that would interfere with us forming a nice seal in the posterior palate. If there's a big lingual torus like this, especially if they're on both sides, it could create a severe undercut that would interfere with seeding or a removing of the complete denture. Now, if a torus was only on one side, it was creating an undercut only on one side of the patient, it could be okay because the patient could always seat that side of the denture first and follow up with seating the other side. But severe undercuts on both sides would make it so the denture just can't seat properly. And a torus that's this large could just be really painful for the patient. So you have to think about this thin overlying soft tissue gets really sensitive, gets a lot of ulcers on it with the denture constantly rubbing there. So that can definitely be a problem and something really wanna to talk to the patient about beforehand and say, listen, you might wanna go through this um, extra surgery, especially if they had to get some teeth extracted before getting the denture, they'd be numb in that area. And it could really benefit them to reduce those tori or remove them completely before you fabricate a denture. Next we have vestibuloplasty, which is to increase the relative height of the alveolar process to increase the denture base area 
by apically repositioning the alveolar mucosa and for the lower arch, the buccinator, the mentalis, and the mylohyoid muscles as they insert into the mandible. And remember, those are all the muscles we talked about forming the boundaries of the vestibules and for the mylohyoid, all that alveololingual sulcus stuff we talked about in the last video. So vestibuloplasty is pretty involved. It involves lots of cutting and increasing the depth of the vestibule. And a lingual vestibuloplasty is more traumatic and rarely indicated. Like a lingual phrenectomy, it's definitely less common than its labial and buccal counterparts. And so you might want to do this in order to get more surface area for more denture mucosa contact, but again, it's very traumatic. And as a, on the whole, vestibuloplasty is not the first thing you'd recommend for a patient. Other soft tissue surgeries may include having to reposition the mental nerve if you were really increasing the depth of the vestibule. And again, the concept here would be to increase the surface area of denture to soft tissue contact in order to get a better seal. Because the lower denture is often the much less well-fitting denture as opposed to the upper denture, which has that whole palate space to create a bunch of surface area and the lower denture just doesn't have that with the tongue in the way. So sometimes you need to increase surface area by doing something like this. And lastly, we have bone augmentation. This involves placing a bone graft and sources could include iliac crest of the hip and the rib and um, hydroxyapatite is this biocompatible bone substitute. Uh, and these are all things that we'll cover when we talk about um, either oral surgery and or the periodontal sections of the board exam. And so bone augmentation is just another way of increasing your ridge height and getting more surface area for the denture. And note that it's much more difficult though to restore vertical ridge height than it is horizontal ridge height. And that's what I have here. So, or horizontal ridge width, I should say. So ridge width is generally much easier to improve with bone grafting rather than trying to make this ridge higher, which is just a lot, lot more difficult to have a bone graft take in that way. All right, so we covered a whole bunch of different scenarios that would require pre-prosthetic surgery and then what some of those pre-prosthetic surgeries look like. So I hope you found this video really interesting and helpful in your studies. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.